Welcome to the Write Better Fiction podcast, the show that helps you, well, write better fiction. I'm Shane Miller, urban fantasy author, writing coach, and story geek, and each week I'll be talking to industry experts about the writing craft, publishing, and the business of being an author. Enjoy the show. Hello, fictioneers, and welcome to episode eight of the Write Better Fiction podcast. Today, I'm chatting to the host of the Indie Author podcast, Matty Dalrymple, about short fiction and how to sell it. You'll pick up a ton of great tips on all things short fiction, so make sure you stay tuned for that. But first, it's time for question of the week. Last week's question was, what is your favorite part of the writing process and why? Mary Van Everbrook said, my favorite part of the writing process is writing the initial and final chapters. And I have to agree, one of my favorite things is when you first start and you get the first words down on that initial chapter. It's, yeah, it's pretty amazing. No feeling like it. And Chris Spizak herself, last week's guest, said, my favorite part of the writing process depends on what stage I'm in right now. And right now, it's the thrill of discovery. That's amazing. I am also in the thrill of discovery, which I'll be talking about in a moment. But this week's question is, what is your favorite short story? Okay, it's time for my update from the writing chair. Yes, I'm in the thrill of discovery this week. I dove right back into Death Witch, which is the brand new novel in my Thea Starling series. And I'm heavily into the outlining phase now. I've got 20 scenes outlined so far. And I am loving it. It's been so long since I wrote fiction and I've missed it. So getting to know some new characters and play around with a new story is fantastic. In other news, if anyone's going to Mark Dawson's SPS Live conference in June, let me know because I'll be there and I'd love to meet up. If you want early access to episodes and exclusive access to the Fictioneer community, on Discord, where you'll get to participate in things like question of the week and weekly accountability, you can support the Write Better Fiction podcast on Patreon for $5 a month. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash write better fiction. When I hit 50 patrons, I'm going to start recording a monthly Q&A to answer your writerly questions. Okay, that's about it from me. So let's get into the interview with Matty. Hello and welcome to the Write Better Fiction podcast. Today I'm joined by Matty Dalrymple. Matty Dalrymple is the author of the Lizzie Ballard thrillers, beginning with Rock, Paper, Scissors, the Ancaneer Suspense novels, beginning with The Sense of Death, and the Ancaneer Suspense shorts, including Close These Eyes. She's a member of the International Thriller Writers and Sisters in Crime Associations. Matty also podcasts, writes, speaks, and consults on the writing craft and the publishing voyage as the indie author, and that's indie with a Y. She has written books on the business of short fiction and podcasting for authors, and her articles have appeared in Writer's Digest magazine. She's a member of the Alliance of Independent Authors. Hi, Matty, and welcome to the show. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. Happy to have you on. So if we could start by you just telling us a little bit about you and your writing journey. Well, uh, You've shared some of it already, but <laughs> it, it really started, it started back in 2013, actually it started back in 2011, um, because my husband and I were on vacation in uh, Yellowstone National Park, and we were staying at one of the park hotels there, an old historic structure, and um, if ever a place was going to be haunted, it would be the Yellowstone Hotel, <laughs> and I started describing to him this scene that I had seen play out in my mind. It was one of those things that, you know, as I was falling asleep, I would sort of play through it in my mind, and over the probably years that um, the scene came to me, it became more and more fleshed out, uh, more and more real to me, and I was describing it to him, and he said, uh, you know, you should uh, write that down. And I said, well, it's playing out like a movie and I don't really want to write a screenplay. But he said, well, you know, try it as a novel. And then two years later, uh, two and a half years later, I published my first novel, which was the first Anne Kinnear suspense novel, The Sense of Death. And um, since then, I've published uh, five more Anne Kinnear suspense novels. The most recent one just came out um, earlier this year. And I have three Lizzie Ballard thrillers, and they all have something to do with the idea of what happens when an extraordinary ability transforms an ordinary life. And I ended up having to spin up a second series because the other extraordinary ability I came up with didn't fit in the world of the first extraordinary ability that Anne Kinnear has. So 
um, yeah, that's sort of the background of my fiction writing. And then I got very interested in the craft and business of writing um, and publishing, which is what made me decide to launch the indie author and uh, also add nonfiction books to my collection. Awesome. And we're here today to talk about writing and publishing short fiction. So mm -hmm. could we start by maybe you defining what short fiction is and what the different types of short fiction are as well? Yeah, well, there's a huge span of what is considered short fiction. So if you're following the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association, I believe that anything under 40,000 words is considered short fiction, and that's divided into everything from microfiction or flash fiction to um, novellas, novelettes. And um, so it it can really fall anywhere in there. And the book that I wrote with Mark Leslie Lefebvre, Taking the Short Tech. Fantastic about... book, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we covered what you can do from a business point of view with all of those different uh, types of fiction, everything from, you know, putting a 100 word um, flash fiction item on a postcard that you might send to bookstores to, you know, serializing a longer work. Um, so yeah, there's a, a lot falls into the short fiction category. Yeah, for sure. And it can be hard. I think like when I was first starting out, I didn't know the difference between flash and, and short and like novella, novelette and all that type of stuff. So if you are um a listener and you're thinking I don't know what any of this stuff means then obviously Matty's just explained it to you but yeah. you don't necessarily have to write so if you can't I know authors who can't write short stories but they can write flash so there's lots of different yeah. ways that we can employ short fiction right yeah exactly I think that um I mean a really good example that can help you in other works is just using it as almost uh, to greasing, grease the wheels of your writing so that if you find you're working on a novel, but you're stuck, um, then, you know, set yourself a task of writing a 100 word short story. I interviewed for the Indie Author Podcast, uh, Ran Walker, who specializes in 100 word pieces of short fiction, which I think are called drabbles. Yes. And um, <laughs> he's done all sorts of things like 100 100 word stories that together make an overarching story it's you know there's really no end to the um either the creative or the business uses you can put short fiction to yeah definitely so other than kind of what you've said there what are some of the benefits of writing short fiction for for people who might not be familiar with the the form well, I can sort of describe what launched me into short fiction, which is that I had written the first Anne Kinnear novel, and then I wrote the second one, The Sense of Reckoning, and then I had this other idea for another extraordinary ability that I couldn't quite bake into the Anne world, and so I knew I wanted to write a separate book about that. I thought it was going to be a standalone, and so that was the first Lizzie Ballard thriller, Rock, Paper, Scissors, and while I was working on that, I wanted to give my readers, my Anne fans, some Anne to tide them over. And especially when it became clear it wasn't going to be a standalone, it was going to be a trilogy. And so there was probably three years, I'd say, where I wasn't writing any Anne books and I wanted, but I wanted to keep the Anne fans engaged. And so I started writing short. And for me, they turned out to be between four and 6,000 word stories. Um, about Anne. And uh, the Anne character and storyline lent itself nicely to that because she's a woman who can sense spirits and she has a business around sensing spirits, you know, going into homes and telling potential home buyers if their home is uh, haunted and things like that. And so she has this whole series of engagements. I try to treat it very in a very business-like way. She has engagements. The business is run by her brother, Mike. It involves contracts. You know, it's just like hiring any other professional. And so it's nice because the short stories can either be a short look into, you know, a short engagement that Anne has um, that, that doesn't require a novel length treatment or, you know, a circumstance she just happens to stumble into as a result of her being able to um, see and communicate with dead people. And so it was very easy to come up with ideas for the short stories. And that was really my impetus for writing them. And it, it brought up an interesting sort of dilemma because 
I was writing them and publishing them, independently publishing them, specifically targeting my current readers. So I knew that they were familiar with the characters, they were familiar with the premise. Um, and then I realized that if I wanted to reach a wider audience with them, I was going to have to take a slightly different um, approach to it. And so, you know, among the many, many other both craft and business considerations people have to bake into this is who do you want to work, reach your story with and and how best to do that? What can you assume about what they know about your characters, as opposed to, for example, if you want to use short fiction in another way that's very common, which is as a reader magnet. So an example there is that I'm just finishing um, my first my first co-authored piece of fiction. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, which has been very interesting. It came about because um, in the first book, I have a reference to Anne Kinnear's former boyfriend, Dan Kaminsky. And I kind of used Dan Kaminsky as a way of explaining the problems Anne has when people who don't believe that she can really see dead people, you know, runs <laughs> into them. So, she, you know, she had this relationship, it broke up because he didn't really believe she could do this, thought she was crazy or whatever, you know, recommended that she get psychological help. And so later, after The Sense of Death came out, I met Jane Gorman, who writes the Adam Kaminsky um, thrillers. And so I was like, someday we have to get Anne together with her former boyfriend Dan's I don't know cousin Adam and um who is a Philadelphia police uh detective uh we uh, Jane and I both live in the Philadelphia area and as do Adam and Ann our protagonists and so that was a scenario where our goal was to write a story that would reach each, each other's um fan bases you know she could she could promote it as a giveaway to her email list. I could do that for my email list. We would introduce each other to each other's books. And, you know, I think the tone um, is very similar. So I think that people who like the Anne books would like the Adam Kaminsky books and vice versa. So, um, you know, that's just another, another business purpose you can put the short fiction to. And it's a little bit different because in this case, I know that her readers are probably not already going to know Anne and she knows that her readers, you know, what I'm trying to say, they don't know each other's yeah, yeah. protagonists. And so the um, the way we had to set that up was a little different. But yeah, just if you're wanting to put it uh, to a business use where you're going to be sharing it out rather than just for yourself, which is perfectly legitimate use for short fiction as well, then you have to make sure you're thinking through those things about like how much your reader is going to know about your characters. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. I'd never thought of co-writing. Like we often think of co-writing as, right, I'm going to start a series with somebody else. Yeah. I'd never thought of co-writing as, oh, we could both do a crossover, which would benefit both of our, our mailing list. That's pretty cool. It was very interesting because Jane's, uh, Jane Gorman's books are not supernatural in yeah. any way. So we were, we were overlapping, you know, Anne who can send spirits with this very more like traditional police procedural kind of thing. And it was interesting because on the one hand, if I was Adam Kaminsky, Philadelphia police detective encountering a woman who says she can talk to dead people, then <laughs> I'm going to be a little skeptical. Yeah. And, but we, then we had to think about it like, well, we don't want them to be so skeptical that the Anne fans are resentful, that he doesn't appreciate <laughs> Anne's ability. Um, so it was very interesting. It was a super fun exercise. And uh, we're just finishing that up now. Oh, yeah, I bet. That's awesome. So... I've written short fiction before in, in a way that you're describing, usually for a reader magnet, and I find it really hard to stick to the smaller word count. So what are some of your tips for kind of keeping our word count short? Well, I guess my first question would be, do you have to? I mean, if you're writing <laughs> a reader magnet, then your readers might be perfectly happy with a 15,000 word reader magnet. If you're, if you're trying to keep it short because you want to contain the time investment that you're putting into something, which is basically a giveaway, then I think the guidelines about you narrow down the number of characters, you narrow down the the scenes, the settings, you know, you keep it a, a small cast in one place. Um, but if you're not, if you're not limiting it for your own like business and time management purposes, then um you know, you could always try writing a longer one and asking your readers for input and saying, you know, is this 
uh, entertaining for you. Also, I would say that if you're writing it actually for sale, then you could probably charge a little more yeah. <laughs> for something that was more like a novella than it was like a traditionally length short story. So um, it was one of those reasons, like, are you being driven by needing to cut back the words because of one of those reasons? Yeah, probably. I just, I'm so used to seeing, oh, we put out a short story for the reader magnet that I think, not just me, but I'm sure a lot of authors think, oh, that's what I have to do to to kind of produce a good reader magnet. And since then, I have seen obviously longer works. We've seen things like authors putting bundles out for, for readers if they have a big enough backlist to be fortunate enough to do that. So yeah, I guess you've made me think about it in a way like don't confine yourself to one thing. If you're writing a short story and it ends up blossoming into a novella or even a novel, because that can happen too, then yeah. fine, right? Yeah, and you can always look at different approaches. Like you could say, if you join my uh, email list, then every month I'll send you my 100 word short story. Mm. You know, you you could do something like that. And um, that can be fun because it's less of a time investment, although it's more of a time investment than you would think, because there's that line about, I'm sorry, I didn't write you a shorter letter, but I didn't have time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like that with 100 word stories. You know, you have to massage every single word uh, much more than you would in a 80 or 90 or 100,000 word novel. Um, but yeah, those are all, you know, you could write a piece of micro fiction that would just go at the top of your email um your emails as a little, you know, a little treat for people. And I think that's the way to think of it, that sometimes people want the the full banquet of a novel and sometimes they just want the little Hershey kiss of, yeah, yeah. you know, a tiny piece of fiction. <laughs> that's great. Um, you mentioned time, time investment a couple of times there. And in your Writer's Digest article, you spoke about kind of optimizing the speed of your craft, but you also said something which I thought was really poignant, that we should invest or rather we should take as much care to put as much quality into our short stories as we do our full length works. Can you talk a bit about that and why it's so important to still treat a, a short story with the respect it deserves? Yeah, well, I think any writing you put out there is going to be an opportunity for readers to either appreciate or not appreciate your craft. And so, especially if you're writing something as a reader magnet or a funnel to other works, then you want the you want that teaser piece of material to be of the same quality and ideally the same high quality as um, the other works that you're leading them to. Uh, you also want to make sure that it's consistent in tone and, you know, maybe not necessarily characters, but you don't want to be writing a cozy short story and then lead them to, you know, <laughs> horror or erotica or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think that um, every piece of writing we put out there deserves the same care. And I love the nautical metaphor for the writing craft and publishing <laughs> voyage. And I'm pointing to yeah. the picture of the sailboat that I have on my wall. Um, and it's like setting your passenger readers off on a journey in, in a boat that you've created in a vessel, in the craft you've created. And um, you have to make sure it's watertight. You don't want them to be halfway on their voyage. And now the boat's sinking underneath them. And that's not a good experience for anyone. But I realized that at the same time, the money you can invest in a 4,000 word story that you're going to be selling for 99 cents is somewhat different than, um, you know, the money you can invest in a novel in terms, especially of cover design and um, editing. And so I think that there are steps people can take that help them ensure that high level of quality without making the same uh, dollar investment. So that can be um, tapping into other members of your writer's group, especially if you, you belong to a genre specific group of writers and asking them for help in terms of being beta readers or uh, proofreaders. Um, you know, you can share out that service among a group of writers that you bring together who understand the conventions of the genre of the short fiction that you're writing in and the tropes. Um, and then the advice that I give to people about uh, book cover creation is that um, I have a professional cover designer who does the covers of all my um, novels. And I ask them to create a template for me. So it's basically, you know, um, an Anne Kinnear suspense novel at the top. It has the title in a certain combination of fonts and it has uh, my name at the bottom in a certain font. 
And so once I had that template, um, the covers of the novels of the Anne Kinnear novels are basically a central image like a brass hand or a, a feather or something like that. And so what I can do, what I could do once I had the template is I could go into a program like Canva, for example, and I could find stock photos there or stock photos from deposit photo or uh, something like that. And I could create my own cover, which looked in thumbnail size, exactly as nice as um, the covers that my professional cover designer was doing. Now, if you see the covers of my novels in print, you can see that there's a lot of subtlety that's going on there in the work that they did. But um, in a list of thumbnails, and my my um, short stories are only available in ebook, they look indistinguishable and they're all very clearly branded. And I have like a little banner in the corner that says short story so people don't think that they're getting a novel length work. Um, but yeah, there are steps like that you can take to make sure that you really are hitting that high bar of quality, but you're not investing, you know, 10 times more in achieving that than you will ever earn back from the story. Yeah, and that's such a good idea. I know because a lot of people are worried about investing a lot of money in short story production, obviously. So asking for a template for a cover and then just finding your own stock photos, that's, yeah, that's a great tip. Absolutely. I, I'll also share another tip that I just mm. recently discovered, and this isn't specific to um, short fiction. It would be applicable to any kind of ebook cover. And that is that after many years, I love my book covers, but they're very, I shouldn't say, but they are very subtle <laughs> and they're very subtle. Like yeah. in a list of thumbnails, the beautiful subtleties get lost. And so I finally... Um, realized that I was kind of out of step also with what was going on in my genre. So I subscribed to um, the uh, Kindle Trends newsletter from Matt, mm -hmm. Nat Connor. And it, among other things, it shows a montage of all the top 100 Kindle books in your genre, in whatever genre you sub subscribe to. And so I'm in the mystery thriller suspense genre. And everything is the big yellow sans serif letters, right? With like, the branches of the trees yeah, like yeah. intertwined with the letter. That's <laughs> like, that's all the rage now. And um, there was a glorious week when my, one of my books was <laughs> in that <laughs> montage. And it was really clear, like you totally lost the beautiful subtlety of the design. And so um, in addition to getting the template from my cover designer, she had given me the background image uh, wraparound of the um, print book, but with no text on it. So it was oh, right. just, you know, a landscape oriented image. Yeah. And so by having that, I was able to apply the same template approach that I had um, with my short stories to all my ebooks. And I made the um, the title much bigger in yellow because <laughs> that's what everybody's doing <laughs> yeah. and made my uh, author name bolder because I think that's also another um tip i was talking talking with uh, tom holbrook he had helped me uh, make some of these changes suggested some of these changes to me and it was like make your name big and bold because like why not you know you deserve it as much as everybody else and i think it really does make a more professional appearance and other than the time investment i spent on canva doing that um it was basically a free cover upgrade for me so th that kind of thing applies whether you're doing short fiction long fiction as long as it's an ebook form yeah, that's great. And I will say Tom is always full of great advice. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Really definitely. helpful. I had a really helpful conversation with Tom. Cool. So we've spoken about writing. Let's talk about the publishing side of short fiction now. So what are some of the ways that we can license our rights for short fiction and actually start making money from it? Well, I specifically like talking about indie publishing short fiction. And when I teamed up with Mark Lefebvre to write Taking the Short Tack, it was great because my experience was had been pretty much all in um, indie published fiction. Mark has uh, a lot of experience across both indie and traditionally published short fiction. And so, you know, he was able to fill in the gaps that I had. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to try everything that Mark says, yeah. ev everything Mark <laughs> includes in the book, I'm going to give it a try. And so <laughs> I had written a short story. Um, and um, I followed a piece of advice that I think that I picked up from uh, Douglas Smith in Playing the Short Game, which is a great companion piece to Taking the Short Tack, Playing the Short Game and Taking the Short Tack, because um, 
Doug's is much more focused on tradition, the traditionally published um, world, but he does such a good job of covering sort of the legal aspects of it and copyright aspects that Mark and I really didn't even bother delving into that. We just said, also go get Doug's playing the short game because it's it's so good in that area. So I wrote the short story for um, one of the traditionally published uh, magazines. The tie-in is that Doug recommends in his book that you start at the top of your list. So you find out what the top uh, traditional markets are, like Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine or um, Alfred Hitchcock. You know, those were the ones that I was looking into because it was a mystery-oriented story. And start with them because you don't want to start with the tiny guys because if you sell it to a tiny guy, you're never going to sell it to a big guy. You might as well start at the top and work your way down. And then there should be a point at which you don't go any lower. Like yeah. if you've gotten through your top, I don't know, 10 or something, then don't keep going down the list because it's just not worth it. Just put it aside and understand that you might be able to do something else with it or some other opportunity might come up. Um, so I wrote the story, I sent it off. I still don't think I've heard from them. And that was like three <laughs> years ago. <laughs> and I just realized um, I would have loved to have had a, a story in one of those magazines. I mean, who wouldn't? And in yeah. fact, the whole idea of um, short fiction appealed to me because my father was a short fiction author. He oh, right. wrote, I didn't know that. Short, yeah, he wrote uh, short fiction back in the 50s. He was a um, uh, very much a short fiction kind of guy. He got stories in Collier's and Cosmopolitan, which is, you know, at the time, those were those oh, were the big yeah. names in short fiction in the U.S. market. And um, in fact, when I was in college, I wrote some short fiction and then I would give it to him and he would send it to the, <laughs> the places for me, which was great because <laughs> I never had to hear about it if I got a rejection. I only heard about it if I got something accepted. <laughs> but I tried that and honestly, almost almost immediately, it became clear to me that this was not going to be a path that I was interested in, in following because... Um, First of all, it's been three years and I haven't heard back from them. And I just didn't have the patience to wait that long. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the, I didn't want to give up the control that you have to, if you're selling to a traditional market. For example, if I have a book launch coming up, a novel launch, and I want to use a piece of short fiction as a teaser kind of lead into it, then I can do that. I don't have to say, oh, but you know, this magazine isn't going to publish my work for another nine months. Um, you know, I have complete control over that. And honestly, I think I make more money. So <laughs> I just looked it up um, in my in my scribe count account this morning. And since my I think that I now have six um six short stories for sale and one that I'm using as the reader magnet. And then when uh this Adam Kaminsky and Kinnear one um is available as the reader magnet, then that other book will go up for sale. Um on the retail platforms for 99 cents. And I've made more than $500 from the short oh, wow. fiction I've written. And I really don't think that I would have done that if I had been sending it out to uh, traditional markets. And I especially would not have made it if I factored in the time because yeah. it's a huge <laughs> time suck to send these out, to keep track of them, to know when you can like figure, okay, this person isn't going to take it because it's been three years. I'm going to send it somewhere <laughs> else. Um, it, when you factor in the time, there's just no comparison whatsoever. And so for, for anyone who's making the indie versus traditional decision, I've sort of encapsulated it as there's the A and B of traditional publishing. And the, and I'm talking now about not short fiction specifically, but just publishing in general, the A is access. Like it's more likely that a traditionally published author is going to find their book in Barnes and Noble than, than that I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, B is bragging rights. Like it would be pretty cool to see my, one of my short stories in one of those magazines I mentioned, but against that, um, the, the C's, there are four C's of indie publishing and they are, um, creativity, i.e. I can be creative on my own schedule, not someone else's. Mm -hmm. um, control, I have control over the the timing. I'm never going to have a cover I hate. Um, care in the sense that once a traditional market publishes a piece of short fiction and you know the, the story's out there and they've sent it to their subscribers and now they're moving on to the next one, they don't really have any incentive to continue um, promoting that. 
Now, in a way, that's good because at some point, depending on what your contract says, you can get that story back and use it in other ways. Um, but then, um, at, but I'm I'm still promoting my first short story, you know, as heavily as I'm pr promoting any of my other works, and cash. I mean, I do think I've made more money uh, with the by indie publishing the books than or indie publishing the short fiction than I would have if I had gotten a it's almost like a little honorarium i think in most cases like there aren't many people who are making big big bucks selling short fiction unless yeah. they're really selling a lot of it and that's like all they're doing and that's their business model and so yeah. i don't think making that much money <laughs> i mean 500 pounds though from short fiction is not to be sniffed at in any way yeah it's pretty impressive <laughs> Yeah. And it's going to be, you know, I'm going to be making whatever, 33 cents or whatever <laughs> for the, for, for, you know, probably the rest of my life from those stories. And I do find that I can kind of tell from my reporting that people don't generally buy one. They generally buy mm -hmm. the set. Like my sense is that they get through the novels, they're still looking for some ant stuff and they just buy all of them. And once I have 12, I'm going to publish an, a collection, I guess, an anthology would be if it was with other authors, a collection is if it's just your own work, um, called A Year of Kinnear. And then it's going to have one Anne Kinnear story from each month of the year in it. So that will be another, you know, with really almost no extra effort, that will be another product that I will be able to have to, to offer to my readers. Yeah, that's really awesome. And you actually kind of preempted my next question there. I was going to ask about anthologies next. So you said there that an anthology is um, uh, a work, a body of work that you'd produce with other authors. So yes. everyone would include their own short story, for example, yep. or whatever type of, if it's a flash fiction anthology, a piece of flash fiction. Yep. Um, so how can, you kind of touch on it, but how can anthologies and collections help you not only reach a wider audience, but also potentially make more money as well. Well, Mark would be a better person to talk about <laughs> this. <laughs> because I do think that when people are making money from anthologies, it's because they've tapped into the traditional market. And I think it's networking. It's like who you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mark tells a story about getting into an anthology because he was sitting next to the editor of the anthology waiting for a panel that they were both panelists on to begin. And they, they started talking and the editor realized that Mark wrote in a genre that was what he was looking for. And I think that's really true. I mean, I did a lot of kind of digging around as part of taking the short tech to try to find out how people can tap into the traditional market anthologies. And I kind of think it's who, you know, which yeah. is, is not a bad thing. I'm not saying that like, you know, damn them. It's who you know. It's just that's <laughs> yeah. like how it works. And so if that's something you want to pursue, then you have to build a network and build a community among the people who um, who are in that. Uh, sort of, I would say the closest equivalent to that on a, on a larger scale that I've done is that um, taking the short attack was included in a bundle um, mm. with story bundle. I'm sure because I know Mark was, yeah. <laughs> you know, because his name was on the cover too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it was kind of like that, like that's not short fiction, but that's the that's the closest experience I've had. Except that I have had my stories in a couple of writers groups, um, anthologies, and those were not money making for me. Mm -hmm. uh, one was to raise money for local library so all the proceeds from that anthology which was nice. um done through the brandywine valley writers group and mainline writers group and Wil wilmington chad's ford writers groups went to the oxford public library so i'm not earning money but i'm earning goodwill yes you know we're yeah. sending money to the <laughs> library and then the other anthology that i will have a story in is one done through the delaware valley sisters in crime chapter and that is more of a like a way to spread the word about the chapter so if authors from the chapter are at a bookstore, they could have copies of that anthology and if pe uh, readers pick those up, then it would be a way of getting the word out about it um, and a certain amount of money making um, to help support the chapter. But I don't think that that's the primary goal. Uh, so there are all sorts of goals you can have. You know, it can be earning, it can be um, network building, it can be building goodwill. Um, so I think those are the primary ways that you would work with other authors in order to use your short fiction. Yeah, that's a really important point. The The success of not just short fiction publishing, but publishing in general doesn't necessarily have to be financial. 
Right. There are so many reasons people might might publish a book, right? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot now, um, and I'm going to ask you, what is the best piece of short fiction that you've ever read and why? Lawrence Sargent Hall has a book called uh, The Ledge, and it's about... Um, it's about a, a a group of a group of people, a guy, and I think his his son um, and his son's friend, if I remember correctly. And they're taking a boat out to, I think, collect bird's eggs. I'm sorry, I'm being so <laughs> so um, wishy washy about this, but it's a it's just an, an amazingly emotional story. Let's say bad things happen when they do this. Yeah. And um, it's an it's an amazingly emotional story. It's one of those things that you get done and you can't believe that that was only however many words it was. Um, it's like the um, for sale baby shoes never worn mm. attributed to uh, Hemingway. Um you know they're just uh, packing every every word in there with uh with its weight in gold and the ledge was one of those stories that i read a long time ago that really obviously it, the, the details didn't stick with me as much as like just the feeling of dread like you know something bad is going to happen and the way that he builds that sense of dread um the other story that I like to call out as a as a piece of short fiction that is very effective is uh, Brokeback Mountain, which you wouldn't think is a short story, but mm -hmm. it is. It's a short story. And th there's one where that's kind of violating uh, the rules of, um, you know, usually short fiction takes place in one location and with a small uh, cast of characters. It is kind of a small cast of characters, but um, one that's that's kind of violating that. But again, you know, you you get to the end and you think, huh, I wonder how many words that was. And it was a lot less words than you think. But that was almost the other extreme where the the world that was built was so complete. Um so those are those are two that um that I've loved a lot. And I'm actually starting to go through some of those lists like you can always find the 10 the 10 yes. best short story lists kind of things. And I'm I'm starting to read through those. And some of them are like each one is just a lesson in craft unto itself. For episode 164 of the Indie Author Podcast, I talked with Gabriela Pereira about what writers can learn from short fiction. And um, that would be a great companion episode um, for this one. But one of the things that Gabriela talked about is the fact that it's such an interesting learning experience because you can read a short piece of fiction and then step back from it and see it in its entirety in a way that you really can't with a novel length work. And so if you're trying to understand story structure, for example, and you find the short pieces of fiction that are recommended as, you know, the best of in story structure, then you can read them. And then immediately you can step back and you can see the whole thing in a way that you can't with a longer work. Um, and so it really is, you know, each thing is a learning experience. You can, you can spend the 15 minutes or 30 minutes or hour, however long it takes to read it and then um, really digest it and bring lessons from it that I think are harder to do when you're reading longer works. Yeah, that can be really helpful, especially if you like to deconstruct works, but you don't have time to, <laughs> to delve yeah. into a full novel or series. Yeah, yeah exactly. It can definitely be really helpful. And I, I remember speaking to someone recently, actually, who said, oh, I won't bother with short fiction because it won't, um, like, it's not going to make me successful in any way. And I, I disagreed. Um, for the simple reason that you don't know what's going to result from that short story. I know um, Sasha Black recommended I read the the first Kill short story by V.E. Schwab, which was then turned into a Netflix series. So that, yeah, I kind of think you don't know what's going to happen to that short story. And if a short story can become a Netflix series, then why not write them? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think there are all sorts of good things. I mean, what you'd said earlier about how you're measuring the success is very important. And, you know, it may be that you uh, you write that short story and a character jumps out at you and mm. becomes the basis for a longer work. Um, another great 
use way to use short fiction is to if you're thinking of taking a new direction trying it out in short fiction because if you know if you've been writing cozies and now you want to write an action thriller probably better to test that out with 10,000 words than to get 80,000 words into it and realize you really have no idea of what you're doing um you can also test out reader uh, response to that. So if you've been writing cozies and now if you're, you've written an action thriller, you might want to send it to some of your readers and say, would you follow me to this new genre and see how many people are going to come along with you? Um, yeah, there are just lots of, the very shortness of short fiction makes it uh, really valuable in so many ways. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting you say that because I write urban fantasy, but I am moving into thriller later in the year, psychological thriller. So it may be I, th I might take that advice and maybe write a couple of short stories. Just see how yeah. it goes. Yeah, 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 see if it, see if not only it holds your reader's interest, but your your own interest as well. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Well, this is the Write Better Fiction podcast, and this is my favorite question. So I ask all my guests. So, Matty Dalrymple, why do you write fiction? I write fiction because... I imagine one scene in my head, sometimes for years before I actually put fingers to, to keyboard to capture that particular story. And once I've done that, then I continue writing fiction because the people in the books become my friends and I want to torment them some more. <laughs> that is a perfect answer. We all love <laughs> tormenting our characters. That's brilliant. Perfect. So if we could wrap up then and you can tell everyone where they can find out more about you and everything that you do. Yeah, well, thank you so much for the invitation. This was so much fun. <laughs> um, if people would like to learn more about my fiction platform, they can go to maddiedollarandbull.com and that's Maddie with a Y, M-A-T-T-Y. And if they would like to learn more about my uh, nonfiction platform, that's the Indie Author and it's Indie with a Y. And if they go there, they will find a tab on short fiction and they can get to lots more resources about short fiction. That's awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Matty. That was great. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Matty and picked up a ton of actionable tips on short fiction and how to sell it. Join me next week when I'll be chatting to Mark Leslie Lefebvre all about publishing your books wide. Have a great writing week. Thanks for listening to the Write Better Fiction podcast. Remember to hit subscribe on your favourite podcatcher and leave a review and we'll chat again next time.